Hello, in this video I will be commentating Tales of Vesperia while unlocking the low level challenger trophy. The goal is to beat the first chapter of the game without reaching level 15. In the spirit of a challenge run, I will also be playing Yuri without other party members alive on the highest difficulty setting. This run will highlight mandatory fights as well as supplementary footage to help with the illustration. I won't be discussing story spoilers to a great extent, but if you are new to Vesperia, I will be providing context to the gameplay as we go. Timestamps will be in the video description and comments for easy reference. Let's begin. I suppose I should explain the premise while I'm setting up a new save file and the character loadout. Under normal circumstances, clearing one third of the game below level 15 is not possible. It is possible to avoid many enemy encounters with the help of items, but the amount of experience from mandatory fights outweigh the combat aversion. This is where New Game Plus comes in. Throughout the game's battles you accumulate currency known as Grade. Once you have beaten the game, this currency can be spent on various perks to customize your experience. One such perk is manipulating your experience point accumulation. You can either halve your experience gain or reduce it to 1 while increasing your bonus experience multiplier. For this run, I am picking the latter option called Battle Techniques. Bonus experience can be manipulated better to stall leveling, as it factors in combo count, time spent in battle, as well as used arts. It's clear Tales of Vesperia was made with multiple playthroughs in mind. The Great Shop lets you inherit many of your records, items and combat abilities from your previous save file into a new playthrough. This game is quite shy about telling its secrets, so people tend to miss a lot of optional content the first time around. You can then use subsequent runs to tie in loose ends to unlock playable content, costumes and learn more about the world. In this case, the inheritance allows a great degree of freedom over my character loadout. At its core, Vesperia plays like an action role-playing game, with mechanics reminiscent of conventional fighting games. It's not a game where your characters are very capable early on in the game. A lot of growth is tied to abilities imbued in weapons and it is through usage of those weapons that characters can learn new skills like backstepping, combo chains and enemy specific damage boosts. These skills will then cost points to equip and thanks to the great shop every skill in the game will cost exactly one skill point to use. When you consider that your maximum amount of skill points never goes past 20 before level 21, this quickly becomes an essential feature in a low level run. As a personal touch, I will be renaming Yuri and putting on an extra costume that I like. Changing a character's name is possible in the American Xbox 360 release and the Japanese PlayStation 3 release, which is what I'm playing on. It's a minor detail, but easy to appreciate when a story scene puts familiar names into a funny context. Before I began doing this run, I knew I would want to equip the wooden sword Shinai on. In other games, a wooden sword tends to be an ineffective joke weapon. In Vesperia, however, the attack stat is quite high on it compared to other swords, which makes for a good baseline to work with. Perhaps the downside to the weapon is that it's not bundled with many useful skills to alleviate skill point allocation. Even though this is on the highest difficulty, I still bother to equip armor on. Yuri may be at his lowest point in statistical growth, but some of the smaller stray hits from enemies become non-lethal while I'm wearing armor. The Risky Ring is essential for extended art usage. Arts cost TP, so a low TP cap and high TP cost are a bad match. It does lower the defense stats considerably, but tanking hits is not an option to begin with, so this is a no-brainer pick for an accessory. It sounds like it's contradicting with the point of wearing armor, but it does matter. You'll see it for yourself eventually. Arts are special moves or spells performed by characters. Everyone gets access to 8 art inputs from the start of the game. Yuri is a bit of a combo connoisseur, with many of his arts accumulating multiple hits within a short time. Due to the bonus experience multiplier, I will be avoiding these multi-hit monstrosities for a good chunk of this run. At this point in time, I'm still not sure which arts I should prioritize, but it's important to get comfortable with what I do opt to use. When the heat is on and you have to perform the correct move at the right time, it's a big help when you don't have to think about the input. I make it sound like a bigger deal than what it is in this game, it's just a direction of the analog stick after all. However, different fights may demand different arts. When I'm juggling multiple moves on same inputs, it can be easy to confuse an input with a different, unassigned move. It's about being in control. 
As far as skills go, I'm mostly investing in Art Chain Routes, Added Strength, and a new standalone skill that was introduced in the PlayStation 3 version. This removes every active party member from combat who do not have this skill equipped, making it easy to set up solo fights in this game. Another key skill that I'm equipping from the start is the Guard Arts. Experienced players know exactly what the skill is capable of, but I'll come back to it once it comes into play, so keep your pants on. I think I've rambled long enough, so it's about time we get to the action. Before each fight I will show my gear, skill loadout and character stats for clarity's sake. If I show multiple fights in a row without displaying stats or skills beforehand, that means there were no changes to them in between battles. So if you have been wondering what Vesperia's gameplay looks like, this is what it's all about. Hitting enemies until they don't get up. Movement happens primarily on a 2D plane, but holding down the free run button allows you to maneuver in any direction. Attacks do not conform to this however, and as such, movement is your means to line up your offense. As proof of difficulty, I will show the battle rank bonus at the end of each fight whenever possible. Unknown mode has a 2.0 multiplier. The first few tutorial fights are nothing special. Amateur knights baptize the player in combat, but they don't do much beyond that. You can lose both encounters and the game will force you to continue playing, but I won't be demonstrating that here. It doesn't take long before the first boss fight, so here is Zagi. All he wants is a good money match, but his hyperfixation gets him misunderstood a lot of the time. I cannot let him touch the princess in the vicinity, she wants to get out of this castle. There are instances where the standalone skill won't be in effect, and this is one of them. Regardless, it's not what I would call early game hell... yet. You really have to gimp yourself to get that experience in Vesperia. Making the escape from the castle is about as easy as this boss fight. All I have to do is employ a crowd control move that Yuri learns very late into the game. It's quite powerful. Yuri doesn't have many moves that can hit multiple enemies without putting himself in great danger. Even with this many foes, your offense is still handled in a 2D plane. With enough attack power, Final Gale can flat out trivialize fights, but I try not to rely on it all the time. Next up is a bit of casual monster hunting, so I'll use this time to explain the basic art structure. By default, the player has access to base arts, arcane arts, and spells. Yuri is no spellcaster, but he has a plethora of base and arcane arts instead. Base arts are standard fair special moves, like fireballs, uppercuts, and rapid jabs. Then you have arcane arts, stronger versions of base arts that also consume more TP. They can be a combination of moves or an entirely new one. Every character can chain a base art into an arcane art, as long as they have the TP to expand. One of Yuri's standout traits is that he can add onto this layer of art chains to modify the order of his combos greatly. So how does the guard art skill tie into this? If you guard and then let go of guarding and perform a base art, that move will have invincibility frames for a brief moment. Check this out. It is a very powerful technique. You could say it's a cornerstone for any self-respecting Vesperia player. Backsteps do not provide invincibility, so using a base art after blocking is a great way to maintain your offense and get out of otherwise unavoidable predicaments. That egg bear fight doesn't exactly demand it, but going forward you can expect to see this technique a lot. A couple more mob fights before another boss, these show off the surprise encounters where you can start a fight at an advantage or disadvantage. Classic JRPG stuff. I attempt to make use of the Wailing Blast arcane art, but you can tell I haven't quite grasped controlling it yet. <laughs> this section has two fights back to back, so you'll see this level up's influence once it's done. You get these advantage encounters if you stun an enemy outside of battle. Not something you'll see beyond this instance as mandatory encounters are not prompted directly from the enemies chilling in the overworld. The mermans aren't too quick on their feet, but failing to cancel into a free run after an art is still a bad spot to be in. If you hold free run and the direction your character is facing, you can cancel the end lag of any given art into a free run state. 
This technique has a lot of merit as far as safety and combo routes are concerned. It doesn't rely on arts that cost TP and you can quickly maneuver in a different direction when you get the hang of it. You can also position yourself better for a follow-up attack. Spellcasters can guard cancel their spells which is faster but Yuri does not quite have that luxury. It's still a great option for improving your approaches though. You can cancel the free run into a guard and mostly retain your position that way. This Goliath boss fight will demonstrate not just that, but also the effectiveness of the guard art skill. I like this fight in particular. Goliath has a few different moves, but the fun is in reacting to a right move with the proper base art from guard. If you're too late on the guard art, you could end up getting staggered on block, but thanks to the armor I equipped at the start, I get away with that mistake here. Rapid punches are probably the only move that I can block at this level anyway. Goliath isn't a very oppressive boss fight, he moves slowly and he can take a real beating once it's knocked down. Getting hit at a low level is a guaranteed death however. That's why it's important to react with Tiger Blade or Ghost Wolf on time. If Goliath causes a shockwave on the ground, Tiger Blade gives you leeway as you get to avoid the punch with invincibility and the shockwave by being in the air during Tiger Blade. Guard Art's Ghost Wolf is amazing for its movement, arguably one of the strongest tactics in this run, but Goliath can hit behind on some of his moves, namely the drop kick and the shockwave. In those cases, it's better to not switch sides, which usually makes Ghost Wolf very powerful. Not much else going on in this fight, Goliath doesn't show the whole moveset here. I do want to mention here that the free run cancel that I have been talking about is actually acknowledged in the game. Tales of Vesperia has a handful of useful reference guides in the game, and one of those covers battle mechanics. This quirk is officially recognized as manual cancel. Logically, the name comes from the ability to perform this technique while in manual mode. In combat, you can set your characters to manual mode, semi-auto mode, or auto mode. Auto mode is completely AI controlled. Semi-auto mode won't let you jump, but will approach your target before performing a move. Manual mode lets you jump, but it won't be spoon feeding the correct access to your combos and instead performs your every attack on the spot. The cancel gives manual mode a unique edge over other control modes and the game even rewards you with additional grade for finishing fights with it. It's a great quality of life feature that only existed with another character in the original 360 version. If you didn't have four legs, some arts were unsafe on hit without manual cancelling or you had to resort to specific moves or spell guard cancels to cover it up. New game mechanic inbound. Overlimit is an incredibly potent mode during which you can cancel arts cooldown into another art without restrictions. This two on one encounter doesn't do Overlimit much justice. Adakor, that's the tall one, has unseeable poking attacks up close so I have to maintain my distance to ensure safety. Boss characters can also access Overlimit, but there are a few key factors to keep in mind. There is no visual indicator for how close the boss is to having access to this mechanic. The AI tends to use it when it feels like it or when they get hit after a decent health loss. That already creates uncertainty in counteracting this mechanic, but on top of that, once it goes off, the boss cannot be staggered. In the worst case scenario, the boss can cancel the cooldown animation, immediately close in on the player and hit them before they have recovered from the situation. It can feel quite unfair with later bosses, so I think a little more transparency with this behavior would have gone a long way. By the way, this is considered a tutorial fight, but you cannot earn grade for it and losing results in a game over. This is how much health Adekor has here on unknown mode, if you were wondering about that. We've had our fun with the game, now it's time to suffer. Coming up is arguably the most infamous boss fight in all of Vesperia's history. Gattuso puts the hell in early game hell, pushing a relentless assault with two cops of its own. In a solo fight, all eyes are on me, so I must have a game plan from the get-go. You can set your starting position in the field menu, and I use it to line up Yuri's Final Gale Arcane Art. Final Gale causes knockdown on hit after it has traveled a bit, so opening the fight with it buys time to weaken one of the cubs. Gattuso is quick to use over limit. Luckily he doesn't cancel the cooldown here and kill me on the spot. Picking a good moment to stab a cub is essential. Even without them, Gattuso can cover an enormous amount of range on a whim. 
the unseeable tail stab can hit moving people from a fireball range and the only safe spot against the roar is directly away from Gattuso's front. There isn't much of a tell for either of those attacks, so it's not uncommon for him to flat out rob you of an otherwise decent fight. At level 6, getting hit by just about any of his attacks is an instant death. Blocking staggers Yuri, and if Gattuso saves the overlimit for later, it's possible to get comboed from seemingly out of nowhere. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Pretty cheap if you ask me. Ending this combo prematurely lets me demonstrate the unique stage hazards in this fight. These flowers emit stunning gas if they take damage and it doesn't take sides with anyone. It's another thing to watch out for, but adept players can lock onto those flowers to beat Gattuso without ever maneuvering with freerun. It's a clever application, but the amount of sideway movement with it has me worried about Gattuso's roar hitbox. Once Gattuso is knocked down, he doesn't really get up if your follow-ups are on point. Bosses can still break out of combos with overlimit, but the strong downed hits like Destruction Field and Barrier Surge add up quickly. Despite all the robbing potential, I am willing to end my combo after around 20,000 damage. That's how forgiving I can be. I won't be able to build another overlimit bar to end this in a quick fashion, so I'm mostly free running and reacting to whatever Gattuso is doing in the moment. It's really unfortunate he works this way. If there was a consistent way to tell the approaches apart, he could be a very enjoyable boss fight that takes Goliath's reactive guard arts usage to new heights. His running tackle and poison fang have some sort of blocking frames too, which only make things worse and thanks to the roar hitting behind him, you cannot rely on Ghost Wolf either. Gattuso controls too much space too well, the cops add more chaos to the equation, and this is the boss that was used to promote Vesperia in the public Xbox 360 demo. Entire forum threats have borne from the adversity that this boss has brought upon the players, and the same thing happened with the Definitive Edition release in 2019. Tales games were not very prominent in the West in 2008. They may have misunderstood what makes for a good first impression here. The demo has more mechanics available than in the initial playthrough of the game, but it takes an experienced player to use them well. If you know what you're doing, Gattuso can be obliterated in a minute or two. Take the demo for a spin if you have a spare console lying around. So that's Gattuso. It may have looked easy here, but I had to retry this fight over a hundred times. Persist long enough and you'll see light at the end of the tunnel. That sensation has sold me games in the past, but in Vesperia's case, it has got me hooked on it even more. Next up is a simple mob fight, so I want to spice it up a bit. In Overlimit, you can hold down the art button after an arcane art or altered art to perform a super move without TP cost. These are called burst arts. Elemental skills can change this move to something else, and as you can see, it's crushing the competition. Divine Wolf Crush leaves Yuri vulnerable from the sides, but the damage is not too shabby. Just like arts, you can manual cancel after burst arts to stay on the move. Nothing to it. I wanted to show it off while I can. There are other elemental burst arts in the game, one of which will serve very well in the last few battle encounters. Seasoned players can already guess what I'm talking about. While we are still on the topic of game mechanics, someone likely noticed me glossing over altered arts earlier. When you equip elemental skills, your arts can also change. These are typically variations of existing moves, like Azure Edge, Fireball being Azure Storm with two fireballs. When a character flashes briefly during a move startup, that's an altered art. In this fight, I use four different altered arts, one of which is Fire Havoc. Pyre Havoc is one of the few fire type moves for Yuri, but it can also pick up knockdown enemies and knock them down again. It's more of an overlimit combo move due to the lack of cancel options without overlimit. The game does not tell you about these nuances. You usually have to experiment with the arts yourself or watch someone else use them. Luckily, most of Yuri's altered arts cover some sort of a niche, so there is incentive for unlocking all of them. Ripgaro is a bit of a pushover here, a far cry from the Gattuso fight. It clashes with the in-game story. Citizens of a nearby harbor town are forced to hunt this beast and it's made clear that it's a dangerous task. 
Maybe Ripgar should have trained its horn to extend a couple meters on demand, and we may have had a more appropriate threat on our hands. This dungeon is about navigating similar looking rooms and defeating specific enemies in the dungeon to acquire keys and unlock doors. I'm gonna digress here for a moment while the mob fights are going. I've talked a lot about the basics of combat mechanics, which has hopefully helped at least one of you watching this video. Vesperia is the kind of game that can be fun to watch without fully understanding it. It's a testament to one of its design philosophies that the game designer Kenji Anabuki discussed in a translated interview on Shmuplations. They wanted to create a game that was fun to watch and also play without additional context for story scenarios. Having that much faith in core gameplay in a genre dominated by narratives is admirable. But just like any game worth its salt, the combat is not very transparent in communicating its nuances through spectating alone. Compared to other conventional 3D action games, Vesperia has a fair bit of unique or unconventional elements to it. Players do not rely on conventional dodging or parrying despite bosses being capable of obliterating a character on a moment's notice. Guarding and performing an attack out of it to acquire invincibility is an unconventional way to contextualize evasion. You don't run in the direction your character is facing to cancel the end lag in crazy action games. You are not bound by an arbitrary rule of strings in any single combo sequence in a hunting game. You could look up a dozen games where a player presses a button and the character rolls through an attack unharmed. But how many games are out there where you move in a 2D plane, knock bosses down and react to their counter-attack attempts? That's why I feel providing basic context to the action at hand was essential. There are not many games that work exactly like Tales of Vesperia. Tales of series has a long history with action RPG combat, but they're usually putting a different twist on the concept. I think what makes Tales of games so special is that they have been able to combine coherent combat with interesting stories and characters. While combat tends to be its own thing, the games usually make up an experience that is greater than the sum of its parts. Mind you, there is nothing wrong with a game dedicated to a single aspect or a design choice. A strong focus will always hook an audience, but there is a lot to appreciate in a Japanese role-playing game like this one. Vesperia is one of my favorite games, and it exhibits this factor rather well. But it's not the only game to do that. Maybe you feel the same way for another Tales of game, and if you do, I'd love to read you gushing about it. In case you were wondering, yes, I am playing the English patched PS3 version. Because of the Definitive Edition's existence, the fan translation team took the English patch down from their website. A custom firmware is required to use it, but it's still a good translation. It capitalizes on the existing translation and the new stuff gets the benefit of translating more directly. You also get to rename characters which was taken out in the Definitive Edition. It might sound negligible, but when you're talking about the sum of the game's parts, the little things add up. The cross-reference website for the fan translation is still up though. It's very helpful for looking up items, specific dialogues, or extra dungeon maps. Look up Hyota Vesperia, and you should find it with ease. I went on a bit of a tangent there, but there isn't much to say about the dungeon here. The game was generous enough to hand a full heal save point halfway through, which eases the pressure for getting through as well as staying under the level cap. Yuri already has forced solo mob fights in the first part of the story and all of them can go wrong at the tip of a hat. Once you get hit, you have to hold it. Super armor skills help a lot with that and they added a few new ones in the PS3 Definitive Editions to go with burst arts and combo recoveries. Helpful when you can afford to take a few hits in a row. Yuri gets a passive super armor skill at the end of the game called Glory. Not exactly high in demand when my character is made of paper, but I feel it's a one-size-fits-all kind of solution whenever you can tank through attacks. It adds unwarranted leniency and can water down the challenge. Other solo runners seem to think that way as well. If you look up Yuri solo runs, many of them state that they're not using glory. A bit ironic that reaching for glory won't necessarily be met with glory from the outside. Appealing to a community is one thing, but if you are going to challenge yourself in a game, you should try to find out more about the game. You might be surprised at what you'll realize. I am given a healing save point to prepare for two back-to-back -back fights. Not many notable skills beyond the stable ones, but I will attempt to make use of the OVL plus skill. While I'm dispatching these bandits, I will elaborate on what it means. Overlimit has four levels, not just the blue glow you saw in the tutorial. Each level consumes overlimit bars proportionate to the overlimit level. 
what OVL Plus does is that it lets you activate an overlimit one level higher than what you're inputting. That means level 1 overlimit will become level 2 instead. Level 2 turns into level 3 and level 3 turns into level 4. It's pretty powerful stuff, but it's not preferable all the time. The nice thing about a hyperfixated person is that they can introduce you to the concept of breaking out of combos with a move. As the game goes on, bosses learn to act in the middle of a combo. That behavior existed in the 360 original, but the AI was tweaked for future versions to do it a lot more frequently. Bosses tend to act after they have been hit, so moves that launch upwards or knock down can create favorable situations like this one. It is not enough to be just good at combos. You also have to be adept at reacting to combo recoveries to keep up the pressure and the combo. This alone makes manual cancel a worthy investment. Knock the boss down, guard their breakout move, and follow up with your offense. There is more to this, which I'll talk about later, but I want to point out Overlimit level 2 while it's up, so here it is. In Overlimit 2, every attack restands knockdown enemies. You'll see me try to connect a burst art prematurely during Wailing Blast and barely drop the combo. Wailing Blast does not normally restand on hit, but level 2 Overlimit makes it possible. I'd imagine you can follow up on it with the Dragon Buster skill or a burst art if you let the whole animation play out. At the corner, at least. So with Overlimit 2 pretty much wasted, it's back to the neutral position. This may be due to my choice of arts and the lack of experience, but later bosses tend to have a move that pokes a hole in my approaches to create uncertainty. Guard Arts is a great way to create an opening, but aside from Ghost Wolf, I did not see enough consistency with other base arts here. I felt Tiger Blade was a strong contender. Yuri jumping above Saki could cause him to whiff. As it turns out though, Light Spear can hit during Tiger Blade and 4 hit charge blocks the first hit of Tiger Blade at reduced damage and anti-airs Yuri in the process. Ultimately this ends up being a lot of free run camping. I'm about halfway into this low level run, but there is still a lot to learn. Despite Vesperia being a rather old game at this point, I still have to learn the proper practices and apply them properly myself. What looks like a garbage fire now can turn into a smooth sequence of moves later with experience. It's a matter of acquiring that experience first. I hope you're not bored of new game mechanics yet. Here's Fatal Strike, or FS for short. This tutorial does not do a very good job at explaining what it is and how it works, so I'll try to compensate for it. Fatal Strike is an instant kill. From this point onward, enemies have secondary bars with arrows on them. These bars deplete from all attacks, but every attack can only deplete one specific bar. Think of Yuri pushing back an enemy repeatedly. Landing such designated attacks with a green right arrow bring the enemy closer to an instant kill. Do this enough times and another pushback art spawns an arrow on an enemy. When this arrow is visible, you press the right trigger to launch towards with an instant kill move. If it connects, the enemy dies regardless of their health. Of course, bosses only take a lot of damage instead. So when you see one of those arrows popping up, it's not because Yuri sees his opening to attack, it's because he's depleted a secondary health bar and can go for an instant kill. It's funny how equipping a standalone skill just has Yuri talking over the scene by himself. It's like he's making it up as he goes. And he kinda is. He sees a buff dude do this once and he's like, yeah, download complete. Yuri Lowell is a legend. Fatal Strike provides a boost in experience, weapon skill points or money, depending on the enemy type it's performed on. It's great for mob fights on harder difficulties, as health pulls grow substantially there, but doing one on a boss requires more consideration. It's not a very complicated mechanic in the end. You can look it up in the game's own battle book, but this mandatory tutorial pretty much tells you just what to press and not so much how to aim for it. It's really unfortunate. This upcoming boss fight is a bit unusual. Other party members appear during intervals, which bypasses the standalone skill here. To compensate, I put on two demon seals on repeat and Rita to reduce potential targets for the boss. 
As long as this big boy is concentrated on wiping the floor with me, I would say it is fair game here. This dreaded giant can cast spells and generally control one side of the screen with notable range. I really don't want to spend much time staring down at it, so I try to actively change size with Ghost Wolf to not get pinned down. Just like Zagi, it can retaliate with an attack and it just so happens to love tail swipes. If you have hunted monsters in the days of old, you will know that these attacks are very annoying to deal with. In this case, the tail whip has two parts to it. The weak hit comes out first and the stronger, wider swing comes after it. I'm glad that it works this way. That allows me to block the first hit and guard art with Ghost Wolf to avoid the second hit. It's a lethal hit here and can hit almost anywhere on the screen if you're not airborne, so dealing with this move is the key to success. I said earlier that the giant is capable of spell casting, but it rarely boils down to it as long as I keep the offense going. Just gotta make sure I hit with something that has enough reach. I'm not far from finishing this fight, but I try my luck with adding more frenzy blasts into the mix. The angle at which this boss does the tail whip could be a safe spot for wailing on it, but I'm not sure about replicating it consistently. Call it beginner's luck, if you will. While guarding at low level on unknown mode tends to result in a stagger, it's worth seeing if the skill Guard Plus can impact the matchup at hand, and here it makes a difference. Guard Plus makes your blocking stronger. Without Guard Plus, the tail swipe would stagger me on the first hit, which is a bit more difficult to deal with. Due to my reliance on manual cancelling, guarding tends to be the first line of defense, but in this run, it can be my last mistake. Side switching gave this fight more of an aggressive pace, which I certainly enjoyed here. Solid combat mechanics and an enjoyable boss fight are a heavenly match. And as far as this run goes, the best is still yet to come. One more tutorial fight and we are in the clear. It is here that the game formally introduces burst arts to you, but since I already did that earlier, I'd like to derive from that topic a bit. Burst arts also scale with over limit levels, but only up to level 3. For Yuri, it means more hits or larger radius, which are still good, complementary traits to have. By the by, if you doubted Atacor's frame data before, rest assured, I'm not reacting to that. Like the overlimit tutorial, losing this fight is a game over. I cannot say I'm a fan of starting in overlimit already, the knockback on its activation is a nice little safety net and I start a bit too close for comfort. Divine Wolf does not control crowds very well to demonstrate the potential of the mechanic here. If anything, I get more practice with manual cancelling and I also get to apply the altered art Lone Wolf Storm to create openings from a distance. For the longest time, I thought Lone Wolf Storm didn't have much use in place of Lone Wolf Charge aside from the Wind Element attribute. This is why it helps to watch other people play your character. Watching one of Passaro's Yuri solos from 2019 helped me realize that the Green Wolf projectile actually causes knockdown on hit. If you look it up, you'll see Lone Wolf Storm is used to bait boss retaliations from a safe distance. That is something that Lone Wolf Charge cannot do as effectively and Final Gale needs more distance to produce the same effect. In other words, Lone Wolf Storm covers a good niche at a desirable range. Don't judge a book by its cover and all that. Figuring things out by yourself is a good practice, but it's always fascinating to learn new things from watching other people play. They say there is no shortcut to success, but I think that can save a lot of time in improving your play. After all, if you are unaware of something, you cannot improve upon it. That is why the burst art tutorial bothers me a little. With all the wiki secrets that Vesperia has, I suppose it only makes sense that a core mechanic is handled like this, but I'm not sure if that is what helps people stick around. You can totally beat the game without ever understanding how burst arts work, but I feel as a major game mechanic it's not brought to the forefront very effectively. A new player could try to use Divine Wolf in that tutorial, get backstabbed from behind and think to themselves, wow, what's the point in doing this, and never look back on it. I'm all for trusting the players to study up and interpret things at their pace, but that sort of work can be overwhelming for new players. Personally, I love the feeling of finishing a game and looking it up, only to find out I barely scraped the surface. It's usually a sign of depth, which is a good thing. If the experience has been pleasant up to that point, the incentive to continue playing is very high. The most likely experience should be made with that in mind, but I was hooked all the same. It certainly validated an Xbox 360 for me back then. 
secretive side content might be a cheap way to extend the game's lifespan, but Vesperia has plenty of content to support that design. It also takes a bit of courage to let players miss almost half of the extra content on offer. When you invest in creating content, you want as many people to see it as possible, so that they get a return on their investment. Value is subjective, but if you ask me, Vesperia offers about 60 hours of RPG bumbling and another 200 hours on top of it if you're willing to see more. To me, that's a lot of bang for the buck, where I control the speed at which that content is consumed. That was a fair bit of final gale spam back there, but just to highlight the lone wolf storm once more here, this is the range we are talking about. It's really good. I am bundling a few unconventional skills for a low level solo fight, but this will be the only time I get to take advantage of them. Ever had a boss fight that was really bugging you? Sometimes there is a move that defines the entire character, and I think Giga Larva is... A good example of that. This tantrum that it throws is a combo retaliation move that hits all sides, which makes it very dangerous to deal with. Thanks to the guard plus skill, I can block it no problem, but without Vitality 3's health boost, I could not rely on it for long. Giga Larva has a ton of health here, but the slow walking speed allows me to utilize an otherwise niche tactic. I use Yuri's running speed to create distance and then use the taunt skill to fill up the overlimit gauge for free. The AI will casually approach me until it is in range to do something. Giga Larva has a bit of a reach with its moves, but nothing to discourage long range tactics. You can use this to cheese the boss with Final Gale, but part of why I am building up Overlimit is so I can end this fight a bit faster. There is a puddle in this fight that it can use to heal thousands of health on any occasion. Final Gale and Overlimit are key aspects in not only racking up damage, but also preventing the fight from dragging on much longer than it needs to. Giga Larva has a few moves that can outspace Yuri, so any approaches have to be done at the correct range. You can fish out the combo break with Final Gale from afar, Ghost Wolf into a knockdown when up close, or try to score a knockdown with Lone Wolf Storm. If you use it too far from the boss, expect to eat dirt. In addition to the tantrum move, Giga Larva can still recover from a combo with a simple tech animation. It looks goofy when it's doing the backflip, the tail really sells it. As you might guess, Final Gale is by far the safest way to open up the boss here. The tantrum combo break has a long enough recovery for Yuri to close the gap and stick a sword in. When it's about dealing with the boss's moves, it's a pretty straightforward bunch. Tail snaps, claw swipes, nothing Ghost Wolf cannot take care of. The runaway strategy also sees next to no adjustment during Overlimit. Though it is worth noting that if Giga Larva decides to heal by the puddle, the only way I can stop it is by stunning it with a move. Yuri is not blessed with the evergreen art Powhammer to stop that madness, so it's good that I have to deal with this now and not later. Gotta digress here for a moment. On Twitter, I inquired about what gives a solo run merit in a Tales of game, and an interesting answer that I got was letting the boss live. By the end of the game, characters are decked out with arts and synergies that can break the sense of challenge entirely. I think that's what also makes this type of a low level early game challenge intriguing. I have many effective tools on hand, but I can only select a handful of them. It's interesting. I have built up enough downward fatal strike to perform one after destruction field here, so this is what it looks like on a boss. I get a minor defense boost from it, but it's not the backbone of my game plan here. So far, I have avoided using items in battle, and while I never explicitly restricted myself from using them, it looks better when I don't have to rely on them. This boss fight lasts long enough for TP to be an issue. Normal attacks regenerate TP, but it's usually safe to use them after you have fished out a combo break. If I have to resort to regular attacks, I am not only neutering my damage output, but also putting myself at greater risk of losing in the long run. Because of the long-winded nature of this encounter, it helps a lot to have a way to heal myself. Thanks to the niche OVL taunt skill, I can heal myself whenever I taunt during Overlimit. Blink and you'll miss it, but it's a nice chunk of health which I can rely on if I ever need it. He's trying to get to the puddle for a nice sip of water, but with less than 20 TP in the pocket, I have to stop it from happening. 
I alternate between taunting and using Final Gale to keep this situation under control, and it pays off. I managed to heal with Overlimit Taunt, get in and tank another Tantrum. Had I not done it, I would have lost on the final stretch, which speaks to the strength of this particular strategy. I end up dropping the combo due to using Azure Blast too late, but it's a good opportunity to close the fight with a meaty final gale on Wake Up. Next up is a new, mandatory fight that was added in the PS3 and Definitive Editions of Vesperia. Say hi to Don Whitehorse. <laughs> you could say I got to taste my own medicine there. All that final gale spam, it's coming right back to haunt me. Despite being a mandatory duel, you are not required to win this in order to progress the story. However, I would hate to turn down a challenge like this while I have the opportunity to include it. The extra experience points will come in handy for skill points later, but I'm also putting the sub-level 15 goal at risk here. With that said, I will have to make a few adjustments to level the playing field. Compared to the previous boss, Dawn's stats are roughly doubled. Dealing chip damage hurts my survivability as well as staying under the level cap, so as a balancing measure, I will equip the strongest weapon Yuri has access to. The Fell Arm, Blazer Edge, Abyssion. They're basically ultimate endgame weapons that grow stronger with each enemy kill, maxing out at 99 99 attack. This fight would not be very interesting if I could just obliterate him, so this is also the only time I will use the damage nerfing skills, half damage, and quarter damage at the same time. It's still a lot more than using the next strongest weapon stats wise, that's how strong this Dawn person really is. So to open the fight, I always free run to my right to avoid dying to the Longsword Shadow. Dawn's neutral is fairly straightforward. He either closes in and tries to hit you, or he throws out the bootleg Final Gale. The good thing about the strong fell arm here is that I don't necessarily have to use guard arts to begin my offense. Another thing I picked up on when I was watching Pastaro's take on this fight was that the safest spot against Dawn is directly behind him. Dawn is way past his prime, but even with Guard Plus, he can break through my guard with Tiger Blade and endanger the whole run. It has a deceptive hitbox and can hit Yuri on the side, but it misses if he is right behind Dawn. Combine that with his tendency of turning around during combos, and this is another fight where Ghost Wolf is irreplaceable. Hitting from behind or from a distance are main openers here once again. Because of this, I don't spend much time near the wall as I lose access to the ideal positioning. I've seen Dawn break out of a combo three times in a row, so if you were to turn around before any of those at the wall, that's bad news. With this behavior in mind, I aim to hit him far enough so he cannot easily intercept me. Fang Strike into Frigid Blast, Ghost Wolf into Azure Wolf Strike, Azure Storm into Lone Wolf Storm. These are all sequences to complement this game plan. These moves either push back a good distance, knock down, or can be applied from a good distance. Outside of overlimit activation, there is not much that can get in the way of guard arts in this fight. That also makes this one of the less stressful encounters as a lot of the troubleshooting happens after hitting him. This is why I don't always manual cancel Azure Wolf Strike. For all the good that the manual cancelling brings to the table, Dawn is the only one in this run who can punish the use of that technique. It's another reason to hit him from behind, but if you knock him down with Wolf Strike or Azure Wolf Strike, the forward momentum from free run at a guard is enough to put Yuri within Dawn's effective range. I would be stuck in a blocking state while Dawn gets to choose how quickly I lose the fight. Not something you want to deal with when forming consistent strategies. Something I had a hard time playing around though was Dawn's Overlimit. At around 400,000 health and below, hitting him can cause him to activate Overlimit. The AI wasn't very inclined to do it whenever I would zone him with Lone Wolf Storm or Asher Storm, so oftentimes I just end up ghost wolfing through him and flying to the other side of the stage, hoping he doesn't kill me on the spot. I was thinking about this the other day. Using Overlimit to aggressively provoke Dawn into his own Overlimit could be a strong strategy. This is where synthesizing the Art Sphere item in the first playthrough bites me in the ankle because not only does it double the available art inputs, it can also be only obtained beyond the scope of this challenge run. 
you can carry the synthesis materials into New Game Plus and have it available out of the box. It's a bummer. I know I would have loved to have Final Gale and Azure Edge as supplementary moves to carry out this over limit bait plan. Shoutouts to the Barrier Surge Arcane art that I'm using here. It's one of my favorite arts. A strong single hit that animates well, does a lot of damage, and complements the knockdown follow up game. Ooh, I get off the hook there real good. Someone may be wondering why not just use Fell Arms the whole game and get the achievement with ease? Vesperia has become one of my favorite games and usually when I get obsessed with a game, I like to pour more time into it. To me, playing a game extensively is not just about enjoying the act of playing it, but also improving at it. Solo runs have been a long-standing form of a challenge run in the Tales of Community and it is often through this sort of a challenge where a player can attain a greater understanding of the gameplay. I also just wanted to play as Yuri a lot. Here's another Fatal Strike coming up. The long animation almost becomes my undoing here, but I've been saving the overlimit to cover me in a pinch like this. I really just wanted to show the mechanic in practice. Fatal Strike doesn't kill bosses even if they are at low enough health, so more often than not it's a bit of a detriment in a boss fight. In hindsight, the OVL bonus skill is also pretty detrimental here. The logic behind it was that I knew I would use Overlimit, but not have enough time to taunt during it to restore health safely. If I end up guarding and surviving it, I could potentially get that health back. It's a big gamble for a situation that is not supposed to happen in the first place. Any forced solo fight does not require this standalone skill for Yuri, so you can consider that another point of skill point optimization. Luckily I get a chance to apply it after this. Whew. So that's Don Whitehorse, an absolute beast of a person and arguably the most fun I've had in this low level challenge. In the story he is essentially the ruler of all the guilds that exist in this world which makes him a big deal. This fight made me appreciate Don more because his reputation was not only built in the narrative but also in gameplay. For a combat encounter that lasts about a few seconds for most people the first time around, it's a powerful addition. Even with the new game plus power-ups, it was a real fight to me. Following this is another definitive edition addition. When you return from the forest, you have to go underground to the sewer tunnels of promise in chase of the big bad villain of this story arc. It's one of those parts where you have to maintain a light source or it gets really dark and enemies swarm in. There is only one forced fight, presumably to show what happens if the light source goes out. It's not a bad dungeon exactly, it adds a bit of lore to the game. But as far as swinging a sword goes, it's not what I would call an appealing hotspot or anything. The Murfish and its friends take a lot from their Shaiko's Ruins brethren, including the running speed, so I can take my time in reducing their numbers. Even in mob fights, Ghost Wolf is quite powerful due to the white swinging arc. If it was not a base art, I reckon it would be much weaker due to not being part of the Guard Arts Club. It works well as a gap closer, but the back turned state can expose you to a friendly tap on the shoulder. If you don't hit everyone in the vicinity, there's no guarantee you'll make it unharmed. You can block attacks from behind, but you still have to worry about guard breaks with all the bad guys on the loose. Each enemy acts individually, which punishes short-term thinking. Yuri doesn't have other arts that move him forward as quickly as Ghost Wolf does. Side switching is also very powerful when a lot of enemy attacks do not account for it. All that makes it a very useful art with little overlap from his other moves. Ghost Wolf really does the laundry around here. The chase for the villain takes us to the top of a mechanical tower. Naturally, if you charge into the enemy's basement, you can expect a lot of henchmen, so it's time to bring out the big guns. I stack a few damage skills like Strength 3 and Strength 4, as well as the Assassin skill that increases the damage dealt against humans. The two water elemental skills change Yuri's burst art to Divine Wolf Flood that surrounds him from all directions. This is arguably one of his strongest crowd control tools and I intend to take full advantage of it here. I utilize the OVL Plus to access Overlimit 2 and increase the radius of the burst art as well as change the Risky Ring to Barbatus Ring for a good boost in damage. As you can see it's cleaning house. The intention is to have a short fight and since burst arts do not cost TP it doesn't take many arts to wash everyone's hands. It's 
It's a good thing I equipped Vitality 3. I was pretty much tunnel visioning this part and putting out as many burst starts as I could. It's rather boring to run away for a minute dispatching these dudes, so I was looking to ride or die this fight in a quick fashion. We are reaching the conclusion of this challenge run, but it is here where New Game Plus Synthesis gives me a big leg up for the fight ahead. Overlimit is a key item, and I am given the second level of it in this scene. With the materials I collected in the first playthrough, I can now fuse this overlimit to double its maximum amount, capping out at level 4. I briefly mentioned before that Overlimit has 4 levels to it, so allow me to reiterate what their deal is. The blue level 1 allows me to cancel attacks cooldown without restrictions, the green level 2 restands knockdown enemies, the golden level 3 nullifies TP cost, and the red level 4 makes me invincible. Each level adds a buff, so this mechanic only grows stronger the more meter you are willing to spend. The level 4 in particular will be a cornerstone strategy, so keep an eye out for that. Because acquiring any more levels could jeopardize this run, I decide to optimize my skill point allocation further and remove the standalone skill. Having everyone else incapacitated is a classic way of setting up solo fights in a Tales of game, and it's still a good alternative here. Every time I lose, I have to reload a save, so this last save point that doesn't heal everyone actually works in my favor here. OVL Plus will be a big help here, essentially saving a bar to clear a path at the beginning. In classic bad guy fashion, Barbus summons henchmen to assist him. These four bridges act as reinforcement routes, so the first course of action is to cut those routes apart. I use the battle starting position in the main menu beforehand to align a couple of final gales in Overlimit 3 to the first bridge power supply. After that, the two spellcasters begin to act, so I transition into Overlimit 4 to become invincible. There's a caveat though, I can still be stunned. To prevent that, the skill OVL Concentrate ensures a peace of mind for a smooth start. Barbus does not usually activate his overlimit this early into the fight, but he does it anyway. As I set up the last power supply for a shutdown, I prepare to line up a special mystic art for the witches over there. Take a look. Think of Mystic Arts as Burst Arts that you can only access at Overlimit 3 or 4. With the reinforcements cut off, I have cleared the secret mission of this boss fight. You may recall a few of those GREAT messages earlier in this run. They are a secondary objective in specific boss fights that contribute towards in-game rewards as well as trophies and achievements. Oftentimes they are not very intuitive to discover, but here it's almost as if the game leads you to it. Because I don't want to deal with another potential spellcaster in the back, there is enough incentive to do this anyway. I would like to point out that I got the idea for the starting position from Miracle Child's take on this fight with level 5 Estelle. It's a great display of the character, especially when they're not using free run. I'm too far to stop the witch from casting Windblade, so a well-timed guard art keeps the retry away. Barbus usually resorts to short jabs and tackles, but I try to be careful in not letting this fight go to waste. Every retry means I have to cut the power supplies and deal with the mobs, which does take a bit of time for me. It does hurt proficiency in the long run. Once the mobs have been taken care of, it's time to get down to business. Barbus states that he is the only man to stand as Dawn's equal in battle, but unfortunately for him, he's dealing with someone who was banned from popularity polls in Japan. At the beginning, I said that Yuri is a bit of a combo connoisseur, so now that the end is near, I would like to take a page from that book. Yuri is renowned for his multi-head arts, and he takes a classic Dragon Swarm for a spin. Aside from being brilliantly animated, Dragon Swarm has a fast startup and good combo potential. It's an arcane art, and I use combo chain skills to connect it to another arcane art, or the altered art Lone Wolf Storm, to score a knockdown. It's a little taste of what Yuri can do when he unlocks all of his combo chain routes. Normally, the complete art chain route is a base art, then altered, and finally an arcane art. Yuri goes past 10 on this one. He can do two base arts in a row, two altered arts in a row, and two arcane arts in a row. He can also reverse the art chain route or take a detour to suit his needs. Right now I'm trying to have fun with changing sides with Ghost Wolf. 
A corner combo is fun, but I think there is something to be said about manipulating your opponent's position in a more elaborate manner. Not that Yuri has much flexibility in that regard, but it's enjoyable regardless. This combo drop is a bit unfortunate. Azure Wolf Strike is amazing at bridging combos together thanks to the fireball restanding off the ground. Just like Don, it is safer to hit Barbas from behind. His combo break move can also hit from the side, but it's not as big of a problem as his neutral is. If you recall me Fatal Striking Giga Larva, here's another example of how much you can delay Fatal Strike before it's gone. You cannot attempt it too early, but curiously you can use it so late, you'd think I'm saving a friend from the darkness 10 years later. It was during Barbas that I fully realized the chaining capability of manual cancelling. When you cancel a move or an art to free run and stop running, you are still considered in a combo chain state. That means if you use a base art like Ghost Wolf, free run after it and stop moving, you can still input an arcane art like normal. This helps circumvent manual mode's lack of axis correction for combos and makes linking arts from Ghost Wolf much more intuitive and responsive than using semi-auto mode. That was all manual mode. There are still a few things only semi-auto mode can do. Buffering a burst art and closing the gap for it as well as clearing ambiguous camera angles for over-limit follow-ups are still good to have. Freerun provides a great degree of control over your movement, but I'm not sure I would want the whole game to be centered around freeform three-dimensional movement. In other 3D action games, I have a tendency of shifting the camera diagonally or sideways to get a better sense of the distance between my character and the opponent. I also think it looks more dynamic when both characters are prominently displayed on the screen like this, but that impression falls apart when I have to spend more time defending with freerun like in this instance. What I'm really looking out for is Barbas's Jump Hammer. Out of all of his moves, Jump Hammer is the only one that messes with my guard art timing. It comes out late enough for invincibility to wear off and Tiger Blade didn't do much better in stopping it. I don't have guard plus on, so blocking his fast pokes is often lethal. This may be a case where I would have to give up on an art chain skill to make room for more consistent neutral game. Everything else is pretty stacked as it is, and I didn't want to change out the wooden sword either. To me, the wooden sword has become a sort of a symbol for not just practice, but for challenge. I realize I have not done the dragon buster skill any justice here. It's tied to the wooden sword, and it's a bit awkward to use with this game's jumping. It does provide another way to approach the opponent. Providing little variety in the neutral is likely one of this run's low points, but everyone has to start somewhere, even if it's using the glory super armor or free run. There is not much left in the tank, so it's time to exhaust the last bit of resources that I have left. Notice the switch to semi-auto mode to cover the camera angle. The direction in which Yuri is looking is a bit too ambiguous for me to drop the overlimit combo here. 14 TP is not a lot to work with, but Fatal Strikes recover a small portion of it, so I aim for that just to be on the safe side. All that is left is to finish off Barbas for good. With that, the low-level challenger trophy run has ended. As far as Vesperia's story is concerned, this is only the beginning. I can safely say that despite limiting the scope of the solo challenge to the first story arc, I have learned more about the game. I am also more comfortable with using Yuri than ever before. That alone has made this experience worthwhile to me, and I am happy to have taken the plunge. I've said Vesperia is one of my favorites and I do enjoy playing it quite a bit, even more so after this challenge. It makes me want to continue playing the game, as there is still so much more to see. Hard to ignore the newfound confidence, you know. I will be showing the final character stats and then be on my way. I hope this has been worth your time, I know this is not the kind of video that I typically produce. With that said, thank you for your time.